pray. Prayer. The Christian and the church's call to pray. When you think about these words, when you think about this subject, when you hear the word prayer, we should pray. What are some thoughts, what are some feelings that immediately come to mind, that begin to hit you when you think about the Christian and his call and his need to pray? Do you think of something that is dutiful? Do you experience guilt or shame or even embarrassment when you think about prayer? Do you think about absolute joy when this subject comes up? Do you think about reverence? Or does the word distance immediately come to mind? Or maybe even uncertainty? Or does the thought of prayer bring thoughts of assurance? Or when you think about prayer, do you think about being distracted? Maybe even right now this evening, apathy, apathetic. Or maybe even dare we say it, when you think about prayer, even though you would not say it to anyone else, do you think the word boring? Do you think of that which is routine and meaningless phrases being thrown up? Quite a bit, I have noticed, beginning with myself, that a Christian may be able to say, you know what? How are you doing with your Bible reading? I read my Bible quite a bit. How many of you read your Bible? Raise your hand. You read your Bible. You might be able to get to a point where you say, you know what? I read my Bible. I I really feel good about that aspect of my life. Even the children are out doing the adults. Ivy and Charles Calvin rock on. What about church attendance? Uh, Maybe you say, you know what? I'm involved in the church. I serve the church. I feel pretty good about being involved or at least attending church, but I cannot tell you very many times at all that I have ever heard a Christian, including myself, say, you know what? In the prayer department, I think I'm good. You know what? As a matter of fact, I pray so much, and I think I am so good in the department of prayer, I'm just going to take tomorrow off. I'm just not going to pray all day tomorrow because I am so loaded up in the area of prayer. I am feeling so awesome about my prayer life. I pray the way a Christian should pray, and I pray the way a Christian should want to pray. Until you hear someone say something like that, and then you begin to question whether or not such a person really knows anything at all about God or prayer, if they could honestly say that. Questions that I have been wrestling with myself all week, so it's only fair that you get to as well. What if everyone in the church had a prayer life like yours? How healthy would our church be? What if a pagan from the backwoods of the other side of the globe who had never heard of Christ and knew nothing about the God of the Bible were to be dropped into your backyard and were to overhear your prayers and mine for the last month, what would they think that God is like based on our prayers alone? Does your prayer life ever seem stale or distant or distracted? If you would say yes, then guess what? (laughs) I'm going to have to be in the same company with you. Because mine does at times too. In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 3, we see God's people and God's city put in ruins. And listen how Nehemiah begins. And they said to me, the remnant here in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah is a man of action, and we plan to go through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah very soon. And of all that Nehemiah would do as a great man and leader of God, and of all of the action steps that he would take, 
Listen to his first step. Nehemiah chapter 1, we're only at the fourth verse. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. We should pray, and we should pray corporately. We ought to pray corporately as a church. I love how J.I. Packer put it. He said that we might say that prayer is the measure of a church spiritually in a way that nothing else is. When a 90-minute Sunday service includes less than five minutes of prayer, you can see whom they really trust. When the majority of a church's prayer list consists of health requests, you can see what the church really values. When a church does not take time to deliberately praise God for who he is, apart from anything he's done for us, you get an idea of how big and majestic their God really is or isn't. So we should pray corporately, but we should also pray personally and privately. We should pray continually. As we saw in Psalm 16, we should set God in his presence at our right hand and seek to live in his presence, conscious awareness of him throughout the entire day in everything that we do, taking all things to God in prayer. But at the same time, would you not agree that even though we should continually pray, we should also set aside concentrated times to pray? Jesus did this in his own earthly ministry where he slipped away and he prayed for extended periods of time from the beginning of his ministry to the very end. And if Jesus must pray, certainly so must we. So we plan to be talking about prayer I believe that spoken prayer is important, but also written prayer. Maybe it helps you to write down your own prayers. There have been written prayers to the history of the church. We're going to be walking through over the next few weeks this book entitled Praying the Bible by Donald Whitney. It is one of the most simple but helpful books that I've ever read. We have plenty of them. If you did not get one on Sunday, then there are plenty of them for you, for your family, and then for others this Sunday. And we plan to take four or maybe five weeks to go through it. And I want to encourage you over the next few Wednesdays to grab a book, to read it in family worship, and to bring it with you on Wednesday nights. In the first chapter of the book, Donald Whitney quotes John Piper, who says, if I try to pray for people or events without having the word of God in front of me guiding my prayers, then several negative things happen. One is that I tend to be very repetitive. I just pray the same things all the time. Another negative thing is that my mind tends to wander. Donald Whitney writes, since prayer is talking with God, why don't people pray more? Why don't the people of God enjoy prayer more? I maintain that people, truly born again, genuinely Christian people, often do not pray simply because they do not feel like it. And the reason why they don't feel like praying is that they do pray. When they do pray, they tend to say the same things about the same old things over and over. Certainly, there are other reasons that we might not pray. In chapter 1, the author establishes that, first of all, it's very important that we have the Holy Spirit within us that we are truly Christians if God is going to hear our prayers. God has no regard for the wicked or his prayers other than a prayer of salvation. And if we don't desire prayer, then the first thing that we need to consider is if we desire God and if we have been changed in hearts with regenerated, renewed hearts that God has given us with new desires for him and for prayer. But he establishes so well in the first chapter that even if you are a Christian with a renewed heart that God has given you that desires God and therefore desires prayer, it is still not only possible, certainly it is the case for many Christians that they go through seasons where they just struggle for various reasons in their prayer life. Maybe it's sin. Sin would certainly disrupt our prayer life. But that's not the particular issue that we're going to be looking at going through this book. What we're looking at, particularly in the first chapter of this book, is about falling into the routine of when we pray, 
of just saying the same old things in the same old ways. And over time, it just beginning to feel a little stale and dull and quite uneventful. And can we be honest? Maybe even boring. Anybody, anybody else in the room besides me ever felt like that before? And so what we're going to talk about specifically is a method of prayer. He tells the story of a little boy when he pastored in Chicago. And he tells the story, particularly of his father, who stood up to pray at the end of the service. And as he stands up, he recites this magnificent prayer that commands the attention of everyone in the room. And then all of a sudden, the author of the book, who's the pastor of the church, hears another voice sounding off in the background. And he says, certainly whoever that is, is going to shut up because someone's praying and how irreverent that someone else would be talking while someone else is praying. Until he realizes that it was a five-year-old boy who was repeating the exact words that his father was praying because he had heard that so many different times he could pray the prayer before his father even prayed it. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that there can be good things about praying similar things, same things, or even reading written prayers or whatever the case. The point is that our prayers can easily just simply become empty, meaningless repetition of phrases that don't really mean much to the heart or to the soul. We often pray about the same sorts of things. We pray about our family, our church, our work, the condition of our world, our finances, our future, the current crisis set before us, even health concerns, and all of these are important things that we should be regularly praying about. But how do we develop a prayer life that really gets a hold of us and that really brings us in communion with the Lord where we desire to pray? Well, in chapter 2, on verse 23, the author says, Since God invites, indeed, if by his Spirit he enables all his children to pray, then prayer must be essentially simple. God has children all over the world, as diverse as people can be from age, 90, uh, from age 9 to 99, some with low IQs. <laughs> Anyone want to give a hearty amen to that? Some with high IQs, keep your mouth shut. Some with no formal education, some with the highest levels of formal education, and most of them are ordinary folks, not primarily those whom the world considers intellectual or cultural elites. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.26, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. And if God would expect all of his children, most of whom were called not according to wise and noble standards of this world to pray, certainly prayer would be simple enough to where any spirit-dwelled and dwelled believer could pray and enjoy a meaningful prayer life. It could be that simple. And so we are going to look at some resources to help us to pray, particularly looking at the Bible. And I'm going to try a few things over the next few weeks that I've never done before, not on a Wednesday or a Sunday, that I think will be helpful for you, and we'll just see how it goes. But I want to give you just a few resources to help us in our prayer life. And then I want to get into the heart of what we're really going to, going to be walking through. One really common and historical method for prayer that goes all the way back to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, which we are going to attempt to help us tonight when we pray, is the simple acrostic, Acts. How many of you have heard of Acts? It's just the simple form of starting with adoration, and adoring the Lord. I need to adore the Lord because naturally I just start begging him for things that I need right now. But it's good for me to remember that scripture is filled with prayers of adoration. The first prayer in our Sunday service is normally given to a prayer of adoration. 
And then also confession. We should spend time confessing our sins would be the C, A-C, which we do every Sunday because we believe that's something that should be a model that's ingrained into our daily lives. And then the T would be thanksgiving. We should spend time just thanking God. We should spend time being the one out of 10 lepers whom Jesus healed that actually returned to thank Jesus for what he did. We need to count our many blessings and thank the Lord. But the S, A-C-T-S, would obviously be supplication, where we ask the Lord for needs before us, and that's good. Also through the history of the church, we've found other helps in prayer that have been helpful to me. The, the Puritan prayer book that's been compiled that is entitled The Valley of Vision. The Valley of Vision is something I really commend every home to have a copy of. I use that on Sundays. I use that in my prayer life. And it can be a help if it just gets the wheels turning by praying with believers and Puritans from hundreds of years ago. Our RBC prayer list that we give out every Wednesday in our church directory is another tool that we should regularly pray through. I have to print out an entirely new church directory about once a month because mine is so shredded with me making notes that you mentioned to me about you and your family as I go through every day and I pray for three to five names on our church directory. So I want to encourage you to do that. But what through the Protestant Reformation has really been impressed upon the church to help us in our prayer life is three simple tools that every child needs to learn as soon as possible. And if you haven't yet, I would argue that this would be the greatest starting place. The Protestant reformers, beginning with Luther and many, many others, said that every person needs to memorize as soon as possible the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments can help you in your prayer life. And we'll talk in this series how. They also said every Christian, as soon as possible, needs to memorize the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed should be memorized by every Christian. Most Christians today have no clue what the Apostles' Creed even is. But you do. So much so, you're like, the Belgic Confession this month? What's it going to be next month? Where's he coming up with this stuff? Well, you should at least know the Apostles' Creed. And if you don't, look it up. Memorize it because it'll help you in your prayers. And then number three, the Lord's Prayer should be something that every Christian should memorize. You say, the Lord's Prayer, what, well, should I just repeat that? Give me time. We're going we're gonna to deal with that. Look with me in Matthew 6. Why don't we start at the most obvious and the most simple place that we could possibly start? Look in your Bible at Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And then we'll launch from here through prayers throughout the New Testament, prayers throughout the Old Testament, and then we're going to look at prayers in the Psalms. What about the imprecatory Psalms where God, where David is calling down judgment on his enemies and saying, kill them all right now. Should we pray that? We'll get there. Let's start in Matthew 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. So does this mean that we should never pray long prayers? I don't think that the problem here is praying long prayers. I think the problem is that these people don't actually like praying. They like other people hearing them pray. But listen to what they're doing. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you go, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Whatever you tell him that no one else knows, his response is, I know. In this manner, therefore, pray. So is Jesus saying that we need to repeat these words word for word? I think that can be a helpful thing. But is that the only thing that Jesus is saying? I don't think so. And if you believe that this is just simply a matter of repeating these words, I think you missed the entire point. 
So I've mentioned several helps through the history of the church to help God and enliven, enliven our prayer time. But you know what the most important thing that we could do to help us in our prayer life? To learn to pray the Bible, to pray the scriptures. What are the ordinary means of grace? How do we normally grow as Christians and see people come to Christ? Well, two of them are the word of God and prayer. The word of God and prayer. What if... You took two of the ordinary means of grace and you married them together and used them as one united front. That's dynamite. One old preacher was asked, which one is more important, the word or prayer? He said, when you're on an airplane, tell me which one's more important, the left wing or the right wing? (laughs) The word should guide our prayer and our prayer should be guided by the word. So here is a model for prayer that we'll branch out on over the next few weeks that can help us in our prayers so that we can pray the word back to the Lord and you know that when you pray his word back to him, you are praying for his will and his will will be answered. So in verse nine, he says, our father in heaven. So to pray the Bible, you could just simply read that line, our father in heaven And then pray to the Lord, acknowledging God as your Father who takes care of you in all of your needs and all of your circumstances. Pray specifically to the Lord where you've experienced Him as your Father, taking care of you. Fathers in this room, raise your hand if you're a father or a grandfather. You will never learn how to be a biblical father or grandfather until you've been fathered. And the only way you can ultimately be fathered is by heavenly Father in heaven. So you fathers understand that you have a father. And all the fatherless understand that you are not fatherless in our father in heaven. You have a father. But maybe you feel distant from him. So you pray our father in heaven. Honestly, Lord, you feel anything like my father right now. Honestly, I'm angry or distant or maybe there's sin. And then he goes on and says, hallowed be your name. So we can adore God and pray for the exalting of his name is holy. And then in verse 10, he continues and he says, your kingdom come. So even in your prayers, you can read that line, your kingdom come. And then you can begin to pray for the rule of God to be displayed more and more in this world. And then as you pray for the rule of God to be displayed immediately you're reminded that it doesn't seem like God's rule is on display. It actually feels more like the world is unraveling more and more every day. Maybe things are unraveling in your family right now. Maybe things are unraveling right now in your prayer, in your, in your marriage or in your children or in situations in the church or your workplace or community. And you can pray that to the Lord and say, Lord, I want more than anything to see your your kingdom, your rule to be displayed and help me to love it when I see you in charge. And then you can just simply read the next part. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and resign in whatever you're going through right now to God's will, just like Jesus did when he prayed in the garden and ask God to help you and ask God to help you consider his sovereign authority over all things. Look in verse 11. Look how practical Jesus is teaching us to pray. Anyone can do this. A child can be taught to do this. Give us this day our daily bread. This is where our prayers really hit our everyday lives. I don't know what you think. When I read that, I think, oh, Lord. (laughs) So often do I consider my daily bread. I never consider that. We're so thankful, so blessed, but so many people aren't. And I need to acknowledge that even my next meal comes from your hand. And I need to pray for those who are concerned if they will get their next meal. And you acknowledge every good thing from God and tell him specifically what you're thankful for and express specifically the needs that you find. And you say, I don't know what I need. Thank you for your honesty. Sometimes I don't either. 
But the more you read scripture, the more that you begin to realize what you need. And sometimes we realize that the things that we think we need aren't the things that scripture says that we actually need. So the point here is that praying scripture back to the Lord can help us to begin to reorder our priorities in prayer. So if you were to look at my prayer life, your prayer life, our church's prayer life, and then you compare them to the prayers of scripture, our prayers do not have to look exactly like the prayers in scripture. But if you pull the running themes that you see when you look at all of the prayers that we see in scripture, and then you put them side by side with your prayers and my prayers, would you say that overall the priorities that we see in the prayers that we find in the Bible are the same as the priorities that I find in my own prayers? It's not bad to pray for physical health concerns. We should pray for physical health concerns because God's made us with physical bodies in his image. But if all we pray for is physical concerns, we have missed the priorities of the prayers of Scripture. You say, I don't know that I've really even given thought to the prayers of Scripture. Well, this will hopefully be a helpful series. He goes on in verse 12 and says, and forgive us our debts. So we consider our sin, our need of forgiveness. And then in prayer, as we forgive our debtors. So we ask God to help us to forgive others. And specifically so, we do inventory. And then in verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation. So we pray for God to keep us, to strengthen us. And then he says, but deliver us. He's asking God, as we should, to deliver us from the evil one. I am constantly reminded as a pastor I am constantly reminded that you can have been driving for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You can say, I've been driving for 50 years. I've been on the road and I've been going down the road driving all day, every day for 75 years. You can have spent your entire life driving every single day, all day long. But dear sir, dear ma'am, you take your eyes off the road for one second, one second. I can have been living for Jesus for an entire century, but if I take my eyes off Jesus for one second, the evil one will have his way in shredding my life. If Jesus takes his hands off of me for one second, and he won't, but we should still pray that God would deliver us from the evil one to not lead us into temptation. Pray for God to keep us, to strengthen us, to preserve us, realizing our neediness before him. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we exalt God. That does not have to be the prayer, the pattern of our prayers every time. We see a lot of other prayers in scripture, but it could be a starting point. Or it could be just a general uh, thematic help to show us some other aspects to include in our prayers. One other place, really quick. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. So when we pray scripture, we can notice themes in the scriptures to focus on. And then we can... Repeat the words that we find in the scriptures, but repeat them in our own words based on whatever circumstances of life you're in right now. And then this will help you to pray to the Lord to fill your mind what is good, beautiful, and true. It'll help you to know what to pray about in different ways to pray afresh and say it. In John chapter 17, I want to encourage you to go back and read that. Matthew 6 is the Lord's Prayer, or rather the disciples' model prayer. But John 17 is where we really pull back the curtain on Jesus' prayer life. Maybe next time we'll read it. But I want to just pull out the themes that I find in John 17. I mean, if you could ever hear one person pray, who would you love to hear their prayers? Martin Silva. But if it wasn't Martin, who else would you love to hear their prayers? Jesus Christ, by, by far. Did you know that we can hear Jesus' prayer in John 17? Like we go behind the curtain and we see what Jesus prayed for. 
Good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. What did Jesus pray for? Here's some themes. He prayed for the glory of the Son. He prayed for the salvation of God's people. He prayed over his ministry on this earth. He prayed over the centrality of God's word. He prayed for those who would be saved and adopted as his children. He prayed that God would keep his people and preserve them from evil. And he prayed over and over for the unity of God's people as one. He prayed that God would preserve the unity of his church, keep his people together. Why did Jesus pray that God would preserve the unity of his church? Because brothers and sisters love to fight with each other. And he is praying that they will walk in holy unity as a representation of him. And one other thing he said in Matthew 21, verse 12, is this. And Jesus entered the temple. And he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. If I could be a fly on the wall anywhere in the Gospels, I might want to land right here. Jesus is hot. Righteous indignation. And he is walking in the temple and turning over temple tables. And he is taking care of business. And you ask, what in the world got Jesus so riled up? He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. Of prayer. A house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. A house of prayer. Let's just be honest in our own prayer lives. How much do we pray? The average church, how often does the average church pray? A minute and a half. And my goodness, how long are you going to go on praying? How many church services roll on on the Lord's day without even praying? But Jesus said that His house should be a house of prayer. I don't think that we should go on and on with meaningless words or attempt to see who can pray the longest or the best. I think that would destroy the whole point. But if unbelievers come in here and say, you know what? All these people do is pray, pray, pray. The whole service, they read the Bible and they preach the Bible and they have the ordinances and they just pray, pray, pray. I am so bored going to this church because all they do is read the Bible, preach the Bible and pray. And I think that's a pretty good complaint. 